Okay, I think we'll uh, start the second session now. So it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor John Olnick uh, to you. Uh, I think uh, he's well known to to most of uh, us in Perth uh, for all, all the all the amazing work he's done. He's currently the um, head of the Department of Gastroenterology at Fremantle, and Fiona Stanley when when that gets going, and uh, also heads up uh, the research unit there. So uh, John's going to talk to us about uh, give, give us a gastroenterological perspective on iron deficiency from uh, investigations and diseases and so on. So I'll leave him to it. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thanks for getting us along to talk to you. I, I was just reminiscing the other day. It's been about 25 years since I started working in the iron field. So it's a good quarter century. So I might make a cricket team one day, being able to bat at 25 maybe. But what I'm going to do is talk to you today about iron deficiency, give you some information that relates to Western Australia, clinical aspects of iron metabolism, GI things, show you some pictures of the diseases we deal with, talk about celiac disease, bowel cancer and things on the way through, just to sort of give you a bit of a, a feel for the sorts of areas that we know about. And obviously there are certain things we know and uh, you might have seen in the title that it's an old uh, issue but there's lots of new things and there's always new things happening about iron and how we use iron and uh, the most important thing about iron to remember is that it's highly conserved within the body. We only need about a milligram to two milligrams a day and we have somewhere between four and a half thousand milligrams around there in our body of which just under half is in, in storage pool and just over half is being used. So when you're iron deficient you've got at least a 1 to 1.5 grams of iron gone. So that's how much iron you've got to replace straight away. So you don't need to know much more about iron deficiency other than knowing the average person, by the time they're deficient, has actually lost about 1 to 1.5 grams of iron. And hence it's not surprising that when you actually look at replacement strategies, they talk about half gram, 1 gram. So the people from Fair Inject have got a 1 gram in 20 minutes. So that's about what you've lost when you're deficient in iron. And the other point I want to make is not so much the hormone itself, hepcidin, but the fact that the liver actually regulates how much iron comes into our body. It senses how much iron comes into the body. And it's, uh, all of you have had patients with hemochromatosis, you do HFE gene testing. HFE is the sensor for iron. And when it's not there, you don't sense iron, and therefore you keep absorbing iron because you don't actually... Uh, make any of this hepcidin. You're deficient in hepcidin. That's why you get iron overload. And when iron gets absorbed and you get too much iron coming in, you start to make more hepcidin. So it's actually the liver that regulates how much iron comes in and out of the body and controls mobilisation from the marrow, etc., because hepcidin is primarily produced there. So that's the, uh, the, the thing I'll leave you with. It's actually the liver that is the, the font of all knowledge related to iron. So we'll talk about iron deficiency now. And as Michael's, Michael's alluded to, True uh, uh, iron deficiency can be thought of in two ways. You're really deficient in iron or there's complex things going on which have locked iron away and stop you being able to use it and that's those functional iron deficiency states. And Michael's already gone through and told you there's a whole bunch of blood tests that you can use. But again, the majority of them are very simple. Ferritin, serum iron parameters, we don't do a lot of them. But as you be go from normal iron homeostasis to iron deficiency, levels change and the one thing we know about ferritin is that in simple iron deficiency a low level is pretty well diagnostic of iron deficiency but thereafter the utility of ferritin disappears so it's really only useful for one thing confirming iron deficiency thereafter a normal level means probably very little and a high level does not necessarily mean iron overload it's a great biomarker of adiposity so as GGT as fat deposition goes up so does your ferritin. Commonest cause of elevated ferritin, you'll see, will be weight because 70% of people are obese or overweight and that's why their ferritins are up. So if you look through your practices, you'll find you're finding lots of ferritins at 300, 400, 500, 600. Hell, if I measure people with a ferritin level of 1,000 or 1,500 or 2,000 for how much iron they've got in their body, most of the time there's no more than a normal individual. It's simply reflecting adiposity. So I'll just leave you with that thought as well. Now, iron status and anemia. So how common is it in Western Australia? And I'll use Western Australian data for this because the Bussenden Population Health Study is a damn good thing to talk about Western Australian data with. Of course, there's another great population study in Perth. And that's the RAIN 
population study, and that's great to guide us on things to do with early childhood, adolescence, and of course all the RAIN kids now are young adults as well. So there's lots of very valuable local data that we can use to inform our clinical practices. Now if we look at the prevalence of iron depletion and iron deficiency, in women it's about 12% of the population who are depleted and about 5% deficient. And of those, about of that 5%, just under a third of them are actually anemic because of that. In men, it's a lot lower, uh, but again, we do see iron deficient men in the population and we do see uh, uncommonly uh, iron deficient and anemic men. And if we look at the distribution in Western Australia, it's not surprising that it's primarily in the premenopausal age group that the women reflect with iron deficiency. And the men, it's low, but slowly increases. But by the time you're hitting your 60s and 70s, and we have a lot of patients, a lot of individuals in the community now that age, the likelihood of being iron deficient equilibrates between both genders. And thereafter, uh, you don't see an excess of iron deficiency in women because they've gone through that postmenopausal phase. Interestingly, if you look at, well, what's happened to iron deficient uh, people in the community? In Bustleton, we did a study and we looked at uh, about a whole group of people that have been iron deficient. And then we also had data on them six years later to find out, well, what happens to iron deficient people? The answer is the majority of them never get iron. So we don't tend to treat iron deficiency terribly well. Uh, and that's the same whether you be a woman or a man or whatever, but the minority of people actually got iron supplementation. So again, simple things. If you've got iron deficiency, treat it. Don't assume somebody else will. I often see patients come and see me for a colonoscopy because of iron deficiency anemia, and I'll say, you look pretty pale and run down there. You're a terrible doc. So what do you want? Oh, nothing. I've come here for my colonoscopy. So treat the iron deficiency. Patients better, anaesthetists happy. They'll go to sleep better and wake up feeling better and tolerate their procedure better because they're no longer anemic. Um, also, if you look at investigations that were done in Bustleton for iron deficiency anemia, again, uh, not as many people as you otherwise thought were investigated. So the question is, do we investigate people properly and what should we do? And I'll talk about that on the way through. So underlying causes of iron deficiency, again, uh, we often think about physiological and pathological causes, but again, in Bustleton, this is what it was attributed to, primarily in women to menstruation, unknown. You don't see any nasty diseases turning up there, which means probably in a practice environment like Bustleton, maybe, again, not everybody was being ascertained. You would be expecting to see some celiac disease there for sure, for sure, dietary, but what about bowel cancer and things like that? So again... It just points out that we're not yet as good as we possibly think we ought to be in treating, diagnosing and ascertaining what's going on and causing this. So let's just look at anemia in the population just to highlight two things. In women, uh, about just under you know 3% of the population are actually anemic and the majority of that anemia is associated with iron deficiency. In men in the population, it's actually a little bit more. There's a higher prevalence of anemia in men but very little of it is iron deficient. So there's a difference between anemia in men, anemia in women. It's not all iron deficient. So you need to think that anemia is not just always iron deficiency and things like that. There are different conditions that affect men and women that cause anemia. And if you look in the elderly with anemia, so about 10% of those over the age of 65 are anemic, 20% of those aged over 80. Uh, I think we're trying to euthanise our population because they're all ending up on anticoagulants, antiplatelet drugs, fish oils, the works. Uh, and, of course, our commonest presentation these days is the uh, second number two user of blood is GI bleeding in this state and, in fact, probably globally. So anemic elderly do have a higher mortality and they have a reduced quality of life. So, again, as you get older, the likelihood of you being found to be anemic increases. And in hospitals, we're enriched for people who are anemic, again, probably because of the things that drive people to hospital. And as you become anemic as an elderly person, there are increasing risks of other comorbidities that go with that. If you investigate iron deficiency anemia and you don't find a cause, what happens to people in the long run? And there's some good long-term studies that show, and this is an Irish study I'll just use for example, not too long ago, 2009, study of almost 70 people, aged, average age of 66, iron deficiency anemia, unexplained, negative endoscopy and colonoscopy, they weren't capsule enteroscoped, followed up for five years, the majority of them actually it just resolves, so it gets better. So the natural history, once you've excluded something nasty, is most of the time 
it's not going to be too much of a problem in the future and some of the time it is. So if you're a probability person, you want to save money, do the nation a favour, that's the natural history of the disease. So let's look at causes of iron deficiency, physiological, pathological. So physiological, of course, probably overall very common, um, increased demand, and you all know this, I won't dwell on it, but just not to forget that there are points in the life where it's physiological and inadequate intake, certainly in some uh, communities, that's quite important. Pathological causes, so again, chronic inflammatory diseases, all those things that we talked about or that Dr. Leahy alluded to. And of course, I just want to re remember renal disease. Renal disease is a chronic inflammatory condition. It is a high inflammatory uh, cytokine environment. They have high hepcidin. They have low iron bioavailability. Um, the message behind this is that uh, most of you know all the renal patients get EPO and iron. They're probably overloaded with iron because they've in fact got plenty of iron on board. It's just functionally not available because of the too much hepcidin. So some of the work that's going on now is actually looking at are we poisoning all our renal patients because half of them die from heart disease and half of the unexplained heart, half of the death from heart disease is not known. And we do know that iron affects uh, cardiac rhythm and uh, conduction like through calcium and potassium channels as well. So just to remember that uh, there are things going on commonly that you'll see in practice that relate to iron and toxicity as well. So blood loss, GI diseases, medication, surgery, etc., and decreased absorption. Celiac disease is a classic that we need to watch out for in our community. Now, in Australia, we do have a national agreed guideline for the investigation, treatment, and management of iron deficiency anemia, which you can pull up from the MJA. This was agreed back in 2010 and was based on a consensus between the haematologists, paediatricians, gastroenterologists, and this was, uh, came out of, uh, led, led out of South Australia by Catherine Robinson and her group, um, who happened to be on one of those publications there with patient blood management that you've got as well. So again, it sort of describes what to do. And as you get older and as you ask questions about, uh, do you consider that there's any of these sort of physiological causes? And if you can't find causes and the older you get, the more likely it is that you're going to need to consider investigation. Um, just to give you an idea, if you took the end of the spectrum and said anyone with iron deficiency anemia could have menorrhagia but could have bowel cancer, we colonoscope everybody. Gastroenterology already spent, is the third highest GDP expenditure for medical interventions in Australia after anaesthesia and radiology. Uh, the number of scopes is growing dramatically. It's probably gone up 20,000 procedures here in WA, say, in the last five years, just in the private sector, uh, public sector. So it's a huge spending machine. It's a huge revenue earner. So if you colonoscope everybody, the answer really is you'll have no money left to do anything else in healthcare with. So there's a balancing act, and you're going to need to exercise a clinical judgment based on history and exam and everything else. So we can't colonoscope everybody. Conversely, we don't want to miss people who've got treatable things, and there lies the dilemma. Who do you send and how do you pick them? The GI assessment, when you do decide to send someone along for iron deficiency anemia, should always be a minimum of endoscopy and colonoscopy. Almost always these days, most people are under celiac disease, so they'll have had celiac serology. The only thing to watch out for is about 20% of the population have low IgA levels, and you can't interpret celiac serology when you're IgA deficient because the antibodies are therefore inadequate to be tested for. Um, we will then, uh, if you're iron deficient and anemic and you've had a normal endoscopy and colonoscopy, uh, we can do a capsule enteroscopy and they're routinely available around the city now. And the good thing about capsule enteroscopy is remember there used to be a limitation, you had to have your procedure done within six months or 12 months, so that's gone. So as long as you've had an endoscopy and a colonoscopy and it's negative, you're eligible for a capsule enteroscopy. So it's a lot easier to order. And about 70% of cases of iron deficiency anemia have some pathology found in the GI tract. Now, whether it's tongue-in-cheek that we blame what we find on as the cause or whatever, I don't know, but we do find pathology, whether it causes it or not. At the end of the day, we can uh, look in and I'll show you some ways that we deal with it. And the proof of the pudding is if you treat it and the problem resolves, then you were obviously right. 
So what are the conditions that we see? Again, it's a little bit like, but reflux esophagitis, you all see lots of patients with reflux esophagitis. Occasionally reflux esophagitis uh, can present with iron deficiency anemia due to bleeding. Uh, but the other, th the reason I put this up is just to remember that of the malignancies we see that are increasing in prevalence in Western Australia, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus and cardia of the stomach are on the increase. Last diagnosis I made was two weeks ago, so it's not that uncommon. And often they're young people and they'll just present with anemia or weight loss or whatever, and they may or may not have a good classic history of reflux. And that's what we see, so that's an adenocarcinoma in the lower esophagus and uh, again the plus is if you find these things with chemo radio these these days you I've even had elderly patients who've had this who've had chemo radiotherapy and when they've gone to restage there's no tumor left and they've avoided operation and I followed them up for five years and uh, one's just recently had a recurrence but he's going to go back and have some chemo radiotherapy so the results of treatment are a lot better so it's not as though it's a dismal thing to f if you find it and treat it well you can get some really good results obviously we move into the stomach and we're in western australia so we can't ignore helicobacter um, helicobacter itself's been associated with some causes of iron deficiency anemia due to uh, pro-inflammatory effects on the stomach and hormone production but more often than not helicobacter in the past has been associated with peptic ulcer disease. Most of the time these days, uh, in fact, more often than not now, um, we don't have helicobacter associated ulcers and most of it's due to medications, you know, non-steroidals, aspirin, people bleed, anticoagulants, all that sort of. So the cardiologists are telling you they're saving people, but all they're doing is sending the gastroenterologists and the hospitals more work. So uh, we've actually proposed that we do a risk balance profile between who's actually helping who here. Um, I don't know the answer, but I'd be happy to say it to the cardiologists. Uh, and also, the names of the drugs are becoming more and more unpronounceable. So <laughs> and that's the toughest thing. Um, and some of the patients can't even say them properly, so you need everything written down. Celiac disease, again, just to make a plug, that celiac disease is relatively common in our society. Probably about one in every 120 to one in 150, and if you're Irish, probably about one in 100 or one in 90 has actually got celiac disease. So reasonably common, readily detected on serology. If you detect it on serology, we always recommend a biopsy, and again, this is uh, endoscopies to the point where these days the res resolution of our high definition instruments is we look at the villi all the time, we can just see them, they wave at us, we wave at them and then we beat a retreat. So we don't have to brainlessly biopsy everything these days but uh, we can also see the changes of celiac disease when it's there and sometimes it can be sub-morphological. So we do when we're looking for iron deficiency and um, we're suspicious even if the serology is negative we will take biopsies and look for the changes and of course Picking up a patient with celiac on the right diet, most of the time it gets fixed. So in our community, again, relatively common. Uh, it's uh, a, co uh, a presentation can be just straight iron, de iron deficiency, and about 30% of celiac patients will be iron deficient. And if you compare that to the population as a whole, it's certainly enriched. So always worthwhile thinking iron deficiency, irrespective of cause. Just check for celiac disease because it's got a reasonable background rate in our population. Anyway, this is based on Bustleton data. Uh, capsule enteroscopy, again, so what is it? There's a, a pill can that can be swallowed and there's multiple gastroenterologists that do this out in the community and so when I need it done, I just send it off to one of several people that do it because uh, it takes a bit of time and patience and basically the patient swallows a capsule and everything's fine until capsule gets stuck somewhere and then you have to go and try and push it through so you never want to use a capsule if there's any stricturing or Crohn's disease or stuff like that um, and then it'll go through take zillions of photos which are uploaded to a electronic device transmitted to a computer and then the doc says that's great and get some nurse there to look at it for about five hours and she's almost pulling her hair out at the end of it so all the pre-screening is done by a nurse so when you're sending the patient off for a capsule it's not the doctor that's sitting there you know, passionately looking at every photo. He's got some poor nurse that had to work her butt off and find all the interesting things and then he'll go through and have a look afterwards. So that's the way it works. But it's quite a good test. And as I say, 70% of the time it'll find some pathology. But is that the pathology that's of relevance? Well, the way we determine that is if we have these very long scopes. So this is a double balloon entroscope. It's quite amusing. We, ha we have one of these at Fremantle and we use it like once 
uh, every two or three weeks or whatever, to get into the small bowel. And as long as we know where the lesion is, it's long enough to either get in from the top end or we can take it up the bottom end and into the dilium and up from the bottom end. But in the Fiona Stanley world, of course, when you, what we've realised is when we're buying equipment, no one really cares how much equipment we bought. So we told them we'd do enteroscopy and we've got six rooms for endoscopy at the Fiona Stanley, three standard endoscopy rooms and some for some special stuff. So they said, oh, you've got three rooms. Well, you'll need three of these then. So each one of these stacks costs about a quarter of a million dollars. So they didn't have a problem with us having three of them. We said, we only need one. They said, you sure? And I said, yeah, we only need one because we only use it every two weeks. But it's wonderful to be in equipment purchasing mode for the new hospital. Uh, this is just a pill cam again. Uh, We'll never get the chance to buy stuff again because as soon as it opens, we'll go back to, you'll, we'll have to beg, borrow and steal to get stuff. So we're buying whatever we can now. This is a pill cam picture and there's a small flush of blood there. Again, you can't see it. It's a telangiectatic lesion bleeding in the small bowel. And that's when we would tend to send someone like Andre Chong from Fremantle. He does all these double balloon procedures. Uh, there's a couple, one other doctor who'll probably do them as well. And they'll take their introscope, go and find that, spend an hour or two or so wafting along in the bowel and hoping to zap something so I don't have the patience to do that so oh there we go <laughs> colonoscopy okay there you go no bull it's easy to do so um, all you got to do is find the right spot <laughs> and what are we looking for in the colon well common things then in elderly folk who present with bleeding we always on the lookout for things like angiodysplasia, so these sorts of lesions, and we've got all sorts of little toys that we can put down and play Stars Wars with down our scope, so we can uh, use uh, argon plasma coagulation, hot probes, gold probes, clips, all sorts of things. So, so that's why gastroenterologists like doing all this stuff. So you'll find there are people you refer to who just love their toys, and there are some people who say, yeah, they're toys, and we use them when you need to. But these sorts of things we can treat quite easily. Um, inflammatory bowel disease, again, we seem to be seeing more and more and more young folk with inflammatory bowel disease and it raises the issue of transition between kiddie care and adult care and how you do that effectively. They all have long-term medication and follow-up requirements and they're all young people and they don't like long-term follow-up and medication requirements. Iron deficiency is a not uncommon problem in children or adults with iron, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. And the one thing I will say is don't use oral iron supplements in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, one, it doesn't tend to work very well. Two, it tends to make inflammation worse. And we've been doing some work in animal models of inflammatory bowel disease. And three, it increases the rate of cancer development in the colon. Uh, again, probably because it changes the microbiome in the gut and has oxidative stress type effects. So the combination of those two is dynamite. So the answer is if you're going to replace an inflammatory bowel disease, use parenteral iron replacement f as, as a first choice, so don't even go oral iron. Uh, but ulcerative colitis, uh, active disease is nasty, heel disease can be nasty as well, so they're just pseudopolyps in the bowel. Um, Crohn's disease, again, lots of that, but I won't dwell on those pathologies here. Polyps, so we find lots of polyps. Uh, about 16% of the population is probably at adult level 50 plus going to have an adenomatous polyp. And the reason we remove polyps is that for one of the cancer pathways, um, the polyp cancer pathway, it's a, a, an effective way to actually prevent and reduce the risk of bowel cancer. Uh, there's a new type of polyp that's very subtle and doesn't look like this at all. It just looks like a small little bleb on the lining of the bowel and they're the ones that are the ones responsible for people going very rapidly just from a relatively normal colon to cancer they're called cess ulcerated adenomas so they're the ones when you have a miss uh, when you have a normal colonoscopy and two years later you develop a bowel cancer assuming that someone's done the job properly that's why you develop those they occur very quickly and they don't go polyp cancer sequence they just start as a cess adenoma and go straight to cancer different genetic thing the other thing is, if you're referring for colonoscopy, what you want is someone who's good, who's efficient, and not fast. So you want someone who's going to take at least 20 minutes doing a colonoscopy. You don't want someone, and I'll show you an example of this at the end, who uh, is uh, very quick at colonoscopy, because the biggest downfall of colonoscopy is rapid removal of the scope missing detecting polyps. So you need to spend at least 10 minutes. So if someone says, I do 30 on my list, 
don't send your colonoscopies to them because they're taking they're too fast. You've got to take time because all these subtle lesions, you really got to spend a bit of time looking for. So that's just a bit of advice because otherwise you end up finding people later with bowel cancer. And clearly um, that's a failure of the system of life in general. Australia is the bowel cancer capital of the world. So if you go to Globocan, which is the World Health Organization listing of the most prevalent places in the world where you find cancer, actually Australia and New Zealand sit on the top for bowel cancer. And of course, bowel cancer is the commonest cancer that affects males and females. And its enemy is it isn't gender bias, so you can't have breast cancer or prostate cancer. You know, bowels are a bit boring, so no one really wants to talk about bowels. So that's why there's a lot of interest in bowel cancer. And of course, it interfaces with access to colonoscopy, screening programs. So there's all sorts of things we can you talk about, but we don't have time for that. So cancer, now, just in relation to iron deficiency and anemia and cancer detection. So cancer detection in adults with iron deficiency or iron deficiency anemia is about 12% in adults. So that's an odds ratio of almost six above the age match population. And that's about the same odds ratio as a positive faecal occult blood test. So if you believe in sending a patient for follow-up of a colonoscopy with a positive faecal occult blood for a colonoscopy, if you're an adult and there's no physiological cause found for your own, you've got to do the same for these patients as well because the relative risk increase is there. And this is West Australian data as well. So now just on the other side, because uh, I alluded to us seeing patients who bleed a lot, um, everyone's heard about patient blood management and the growing literature base uh, in important journals like the Sunday Times, highlighting the importance of blood management and it's some uh, altruistic plot to take over the world. Uh, so we've actually, as it turns out, a couple of years ago we got a project that Michael's involved with, but we wanted to take a look at this emerging evidence base of are we actually doing the patients a favour by transfusing them when they come in for GI bleeds or not? Because it makes sense, you bleed, we replace blood, it's all good. Um, but is it really so? Because there's a lot of literature out there that says it might not be. So we've actually done a project here where we've looked at all the acute upper GI bleeding coming in and said, well, given that 21% of all red cell use in this state is for upper GI bleeding in those cardiology sort of disasters that they send in to us. So we wanted to look at a uh, recent control uh, and, and because of the literature, we wanted to come up with our own study. So we set up a study to look at the association between red cell transfusion and mortality 30 days and a year after in all the patients who were coming into Perth hospitals for GI bleeding. So it was a retrospective cohort study between 2008 and 2010, Royal Perth Charlie's Fremantle. So all every GI bleeder that came in there, we captured. And we did data linkage analysis. We had a team of those nurses that had finished doing the capsule reporting, and we sent them to Royal Perth, the Charlie's and Freo to look at every flame and medical record that had come in in that time frame, uh, which is about 5,000. Um, and uh, get data. And we also looked at the endoscopy data as well. And this is just to show you what we had. And we linked it to the patient blood management database, the death database, and we have data on, on 3,400 of about 5,000 patients where it's absolutely complete. Most of them came in once, but we have multiple re-attenders for GI bleeding that come through. And when we look at these patients, this is what we found. We had 3,400 odd. Uh, blood products used in about 63% of the patients and nearly two thirds had one or more units. 30 day mortality, so if you come in with a GI bleed in a Perth hospital, it's about 6% at 30 days. 20% of those people are dead in a year. So that's an interesting figure. 20% of all those people who come in with a GI bleed are dead one year later. Um, that's quite a substantial mortality rate, even allowing for their old or whatever, because we're investing a lot of time and effort and energy to get them back on the street, but a year later, still 20% of them are dead. And if you look at the blood product use, interestingly, we find that uh, there's a 53% increase in 30-day mortality and a 40% increase in one-year mortality, which is actually statistically significant in, any p in patients who have a blood product compared with those that don't. But the important point is that nearly half of them are between 70 and 90 years of age. I mean, it's, we're not dealing, you know, they're quite elderly people, so... Yeah, but that's true, but 20% of them are dead in a year. 
So what you've got to do is uh, sort of normalize it back to the population. 20% uh, of 70-year-olds, and the average age here is, uh, well, 33 there, so 44% age there. If you had that population out there in the community, would 20% of them be dead in a year? Well, probably not, but a reasonable proportion would. But the thing is, we've sent them to hospital, we've invested all this money, and remember, most of our healthcare expenditure occurs in those last few years of life, so we're spending all this stuff, and you know, one in five won't be around in a year's time. I'm not saying it's good or bad, I'm just saying that's what our data tells us. So there's no doubt that receiving a blood product increases your mortality. And if... Oh, I've gone the wrong way. I've gone the wrong way. Other arrow. That way. So here's the uh, survival curves for no blood product used in people coming in. Uh, blood product used. Now, you might say, aha, the sicker patients are getting the blood products. So when we actually normalise for all that, and that's what the multivariate analysis does, it says, no, that's not the explanation. Patients who get blood product, and here's a way of looking at it. I'll show you two ways of looking at it. You take patients with haemoglobins less than 70. Blue is no blood product used. Red is blood product used. So haemoglobin less than 70. Haemoglobin less 70 to 90. 90 to 120. There's always less people dying who don't get a blood product than people who do get a blood product. You might say, ah, maybe they've got lower blood pressures and things like that. So I'll take it the next step and I'll say, well, we can actually bring all that in and we can bring the endoscopy findings in and we create what's called a Rockall score, which is actually a, a well-defined way in the literature of assigning comorbidity, age, how sick someone is, the endoscopy score, the haemoglobin and everything all together. So it actually measures everything about a patient. If you have a low Rockall score, that is, you're not terribly unwell, but you've got bleeding, you don't get a blood product, you do get a blood product, death at a year. A rot sicker patient, sicker again. Uh, so it's only when you're totally moribund that the best we can show that blood does is you're no worse off than getting a blood product. We don't actually show any survival advantage whatsoever to receiving a blood product for a GI bleed. We're going through and looking at this in more detail now to see is it the red cells or is it non-red cell products that are going through. But what this says is that not only does the rest of the world think that blood transfusion isn't necessarily a great thing for GI bleeds, more importantly in Western Australia, we can't actually show that there's any benefit from giving a blood transfusion for a GI bleed. So we're going to dig further down now and look at it, but we've got all the medications and all the things like that to go through yet. But I just raised this just to finish off this talk because well, I was going to do it from a GI perspective. But this is the ultimate, this is the coronary care of gastroenterology. This is the acute pointy end of the health system. And our standard of care, which is based on the fact if you bleed we give blood, might not necessarily be the best thing to do. What we're going to do and how we're going to change practice, don't know yet, but uh, this is hot off the press data. And it actually fits with what everybody around the world is seeing, so we're not an isolated outpost. But it actually says that we've got a lot of revising to do of the way we actually treat common sorts of things like GI bleeds still. So we don't need to find new genes or discover new diseases. We actually need to improve our ability to treat common things better from iron deficiency all the way through to investigation and utilisation of health resources and things like that. So I think that was my last slide. I was going to stop there. Then we can talk about things if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I'm just wondering if you've seen um, more lower GI bleeding with any of the newer oral anticoagulants. That that was a signal seen with um, a pixib, well, not a pixaban, but certainly rivaroxaban and dabigatran in the trials. There was a suggestion that there were, well, definitely more GI bleeds, but there was a perception that it was lower GI bleeding. Uh, most uh, again, this this studies upper GI bleeds, so and that's the commonest bleeding that we get involved. We do see a reasonable number, but it's much less frequent than upper GI bleeds. People coming with lower GI, upper GI bleeds 
almost always get looked after by gastroenterologists plus or minus surgeons, physicians. Lower GI bleeds almost always get looked after by the G uh, colorectal surgeons, those sorts of teams. The approaches are very different to upper GI bleeds are endoscopic, primarily dealt with. Lower GI bleeds uh, usually are not endoscopic dealt with. They're usually uh, investigated with CT angiograms and um, embolization and colonoscoping patients with GI bleeds. Lower GI bleeds highly unsatisfactory for many reasons. One, it's messy, and two, you rarely find what you're looking for, and it's often we don't actually find a source. So they're actually quite different sorts of things. Um, we see a reasonable number. We still see more, many more patients with upper GI than lower GI bleed. But I haven't actually looked at the trends from this database over time. So this data has actually really only got to this point probably six weeks ago. So it's actually all still fairly new and going through. Um. Uh, John, very, very quickly, uh, uh, I know you, you touched on this on your talk, but just to explore it a bit further, uh, one of the issues I have is the indications for capsule endoscopies, and uh, when they first came out, I, I, I think I ordered quite a few, but then with the difficulty in access and so on, uh, I have to confess that I, I may not be doing as many as I should, um, and especially in the public sector to access, that is not that easy. Uh, so I was just wondering whether you could just explore that and just give us some guidance on on when and who we should be referring. So if you've got a, a relatively straightforward case, so there's not lots of comorbidities, iron deficiency anemia and it's, you're dealing with an adult post 50 and you endoscope or colonoscope and you find no cause, from the data that's been published overseas, 85% of the time if you did nothing further and followed them up five years later, they'd be fine there wouldn't be a problem. So it's only a minority that are problematic. If you have people have repeat overt bleeding and things like that, that's where it's a little bit different. So whilst we can, of course, order um, capsules for iron deficiency and anemia, a lot of the time now we'll actually do it when we're seeing overt GI bleeding and anemia and the top and tails and all. They're the ones who we tend to concentrate on more. The rebate out there, I think, is somewhere between two and three thousand dollars for a capsule enteroscopy. So they're reasonably well remunerated. That's why doctors can employ nurses to read them. You see, um, but yeah, the public sector doesn't offer them. The reason being, it's not rebated out of the state system. It's only rebated out of the Commonwealth Medicare system. So that's why they all exist on that side of the fence, not in the hospital. We can get them on special request in the hospital if we've got an inpatient who's bleeding and we can't find anything and we know it's small bowel, then we'll get the hospital to buy us a capsule um, and we'll put one down. But otherwise we don't routinely do them there because there's no rebate. John, um, how long has Australia and New Zealand had the commonest sort of incidence of the highest incidence of colonic cancer? I don't actually know how long, but it was interesting. Uh, certainly over the last five to ten years, we've emerged from, you know, good upper end of pack to being the top yeah. end of the pack. Um, That's not just because we're doing more investigations. No, no, no. In fact, if you looked at the uh, screening strategies for colorectal cancer, um, you know, in the US, they've been able to, you could ask your doctor for anything, basically, from a fecal occult blood to a colonoscopy to a CT colonography to a flexi-sig. They've been a lot more liberal. Uh, having said that, of course, how many people actually ask for it? Don't know, but uh, we've actually been a lot more restrictive on mm -hmm. availability of colonoscopy for obvious reasons, because um, it's an expensive economic burden on the country. So, I mean, I, I sort of, I don't know if you remember that, article in the NJA about someone who had been investigated and they had an enteroagia and ended up having colonic cancer. I guess how long do you go on treating someone or investigating someone with IV, with, sorry, treating with IV iron if they say got menorrhagia and they keep becoming anemic again? When do you bite the bullet and say, okay, well, even if there's no GI tract symptoms at all, we should do yeah. it? Colonoscopy. Yeah, and look, we do see young people who get bowel cancer from teenagers onwards, sort of thing. And but the probability—it's a probability thing, you know. It's very rare. 
outside of a family history. Um, you know, I've had nurses that I've diagnosed who've been, you know, in their twenties and thirties with no family history. Who, uh, and the the sad thing is that if you say, well, okay, if we'd picked it up earlier, they might live. Often, people who develop these bowel cancers at very young ages, it tends to be very aggressive, and they don't do terribly well anyway. Those sort of stories, I mean, just I think convey that medicine's a, an imprecise art because you're left with a patient and you've got to make a decision. And if you over-investigate, you're damned. And if you under-investigate, you're damned. And you've got to make that judgment call. And because menorrhage is reasonably common, you'll probably find there's an uncommon condition like bowel cancer sporadically occurring in people who've got menorrhage. Um, it probably wasn't it may not have even been the cause of the iron deficiency, it was probably that, but they happen to have bowel cancer too. Uh, we're always going to make those calls. Um, so there's no perfect answer. I think, you know, what you can do is say if you're suspicious, then you follow it through. And that's why some people will say, look, I'll do the endoscopy and colonoscopy for reassurance, because after you talk to the patient, some patients will tell you they don't want anything to do with the investigations. Some patients want to be investigated multiple times because they don't believe that you could have possibly, you know, six months has passed since my last colonoscopy. And somewhere, in, you know, so you've got to tailor it, you know, and consumers are having a lot more input into what they want these days. And, uh, you know, we tend to acquiesce in a sort of um, detente type fashion with what they want. I'll give you a card for colonoscopy. <laughs> yeah, I think someone had a... But it is a, an issue at the moment. The state's actually got an endoscopy workforce out because with the big changes in endoscopy access for public patients, so Royal Perth's downsizing, Fremantle's changing, Fiona Stanley's coming up, Osborne Park's closed down an endoscopy service. So the likelihood is th that you're going to have much harder access for patients in the public sector. So, I mean, it's a, it is a real issue at the moment. Um, okay. I was just going to ask about SSAs. I'd never heard of them before and I've had two patients in the last sort of six weeks who've had them. Are they new or are they more common or they weren't looked for before? Uh, I think they've actually been around for quite a while, but it's one of those things that they've been a bit of a sleeping job. People have thought that they just look like a floppy fold or something odd, but now we know the pathology of them and the genetics. Um, and the genetics is quite different to the way colon cancer develops out of polyps. So if they're what we call a sessile serrated adenoma, then those patients really need to have repeat colonoscopies much more frequently. So they're not five-year repeats, they're one or two or even three-year repeats. They're almost like the family cancers type syndromes that we follow up. And they're more likely to be on the right side and the left side. And so the and the only way you can find them is colonoscopy. So they're not the sort of things that you're going to find on a flexi-sig. They probably would never be seen on uh, a CT colonography because they're flat and subtle sorts of things. So it's just one of the issues that make us look at, well, which investigation is the best one to do in, in 